Late last year, Bearskin Lake First Nation in northwestern Ontario declared a state of emergency as almost half their community came down with COVID-19. Charnel Anderson covers the Northwest for Ontario Hubs, and she joins us now from Thunder Bay for an update. Hey, Charnel. Hey, Dan. All right, so we'll talk about the current status in Bearskin Lake First Nation, but can you first tell us what happened there at the end of December, beginning of January? Yeah, so um, a massive COVID-19 outbreak began in Bearskin Lake late last year, and it quickly overwhelmed the community. Um, it's unclear how the outbreak began in the remote First Nation, which is about 600 kilometers northwest of Thunder Bay, but it was really only a matter of days before Bearskin Lake was in crisis and unable to manage the crisis themselves. Um, so on December 29th, the community declared a state of emergency and went into lockdown. And by January 3rd, 174 people were positive for COVID. So uh, according to um, a figure by Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, there are 480 people living on reserve in Bearskin Lake. And so 174 people is really a significant chunk of the population that was infected very quickly. And, you know, that included a lot of uh, the First Nations essential workers, so people like uh, council members, frontline workers, you know, the people that really keep the small community functioning. Um, so they needed help and they needed it quick. And people in neighboring First Nations responded swiftly by sending groceries and other supplies to Bearskin Lake. Um, Indigenous, Service, Indigenous Services Canada also responded by sending four healthcare workers, so three primary care nurses and one advanced care paramedic up to the community on December 30th. And they also approved over a million dollars in funding for things like PPE, uh, wages for these community-based workers, uh, isolation accommodations and security efforts, among other things. Um, but with the majority of households isolating in Bearskin Lake, they realized that they needed more help to really ensure that people's basic needs were being met. So on January 3rd, uh, the community issued a press release calling for support from the Canadian military. And in a situation like this, a request for military support has to come from the province. So on January 6th, the Solicitor General made this formal request for military support for Bearskin Lake um, and a few other First Nation communities. And that request was approved for Bearskin Lake on January 9th. So that same day, uh, four Canadian Rangers who are members of Bearskin Lake that were previously isolating uh, were deployed to help uh, with the pandemic response in the community. And um, in total, the community was promised seven Canadian Rangers, but uh, last week the community said only five of those seven Rangers had been deployed. It's unclear whether uh, those two other Rangers had been deployed since then, but at this point I understand that really the worst of the outbreak is over and the community is in recovery mode now. Hmm. Now, when all of that was happening, sort of in the, in the background there, neighboring communities stepped in as well. Um, some included a three and a half hour trip uh, to Bearskin Lake First Nation. Can you share some of the initiatives uh, that were happening from neighboring communities to help out? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people in neighboring First Nations and other communities stepped up to help Bearskin Lake during this crisis. Um, for example, as you mentioned, our viewers may have seen the photo of the Skidoo convoy, uh, which... Uh -huh. That, so that was on New Year's Day. Uh, dozens of people from Big Trout Lake gathered supplies and made it. So it was three and a half hours, seven hours round trip trek on their snowmobiles. Really cold weather. <laughs> so that was pretty remarkable. And, you know, a number of other First Nations also stepped up to help either by raising money or buying groceries and other supplies and getting them delivered. Um, another big thing was cutting and delivering wood because that's what's used to heat homes in Bearskin Lake. Uh, and so some of those First Nations, this isn't an exhaustive list, but some of those First Nations include Muskrat Dam, Sandy Lake, Round Lake, Nishkandiga. Uh, I spoke to Tanya Cameron, who is a community organizer in Kenora, and as of January 18th, she's raised over $60,000 for Bearskin Lake, which has been used to buy and ship groceries and other supplies like a log splitter, warm um, work gloves, stuff like that. And there was also another young woman from Kiwewin First Nation named Rain Harper who uh, who wanted to help. So she decided to start a fundraiser and she raised over $10,000, which was then matched by Kiwewin leadership for a total of over $20,000. So, you know, people in the region were really quick to mobilize and it was amazing to see. And, you know, the chief and others have expressed their gratitude for all that support. Indeed. And uh, you mentioned that the situation has improved. Can you give us an update on the situation there? 
Yeah, so it, it does look like things have turned a corner. Um, it looks like cases began declining last week. Uh, on January 11th, there were 65 active cases. And about a week later, January 19th, which would have been this past Wednesday, there were 12 active COVID-19 cases, according to a spokesperson for uh, Indigenous Services Canada. And it's my understanding that no one has been ho hospitalized as a result of this outbreak. Um, and that is probably thanks in part to a high vaccination rate, uh, over 80% of adults in Bearskin Lake are fully vaccinated. So now the community is really focused on recovery. Uh, in a press release issued last week, uh, Chief Kamina Wadaman said they're now focused on physical healing and mental health needs of community members. Now, First Nations and remote communities have faced a lot of challenges over the two years of the pandemic. Uh, can you share sort of the specific difficulties uh, that they've had dealing with COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, in short, it's complicated, um, mm -hmm. especially, you know, emergency response in First Nations, especially remote First Nations is complicated. Uh, for one thing, many First Nations face a lot of systemic issues, which, you know, we can um, <laughs> go back to the Indian Act colonization. But, you know, so stuff like the lack of clean water or inadequate overcrowded housing, which can really exacerbate problems, especially, you know, the outbreak of COVID-19. <laughs> um, and remoteness also plays a role in this because it takes longer for people and resources to get to remote communities and it can be quite costly as well. Uh, but really early on um, in this crisis, Bearskin Lake declared a state of emergency. But a First Nation declaring a state of emergency is not the same thing as a municipality declaring a state of emergency. When a municipality declares a state of emergency, it's a legal mechanism that gives the powers that be authority to make decisions. And, you know, they can carry out established emergency response plans, which in turn helps them to rapidly respond to a crisis. And so we saw this early on in the pandemic with cities like Toronto declaring states of emergencies, which allowed the city to implement their own public health restrictions independent of the province. Um, but because of different legislation, you know, First Nations are governed by the Indian Act, uh, these powers aren't extended to communities on reserves. Uh, and so a report from uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation points out that declaring a state of emergency on reserves serves, quote, more of a political function than a legal function, end quote. So it's useful to draw attention to problems and communicate potential remedies, but it doesn't give the First Nation the same authority as a municipality would have in a similar situation. So First Nations are really left to rely on provincial and federal agreements, which can be quite cumbersome, um, you know, during a time when really urgency is required. Thank you, Charnel. A very important story, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, Jan. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.